Our next speaker, please welcome Cheryl Child, DO. Dr. Child was, uh, excuse me, Dr. Child will now update us on nutrition and lifestyle intervention for weight management and disease prevention. Cheryl Child, DO, has been a practicing osteopathic physician for 24, 25 years, a graduate of the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences, now known as Des Moines University. She spent over 20 years focused on, training, on treating somatic dysfunction, pain, and injury. Uh, over 10 years ago, she began incorporating diagnosis and treatment with bioidentical hormones, which has expanded it into a holistic, prevention-centered practice, including nutrition, weight loss, hormone replacement, as well as the treatment of pain and injury. Dr. Child is a diplomat and fellow of the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative and Functional Medicine. Dr. Child, welcome. Do I have a pointer? Okay. Am I on? Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I am very excited to be here. Not the least of which uh, reason is that, is that uh, I'm from Iowa, and right now. Uh, we have over a foot of snow on the ground and have for the last 65 plus days. It's a record. I haven't even seen the ground. I'm so excited out here to see the ground and flowers and everything. So um, it's just very exciting. And I'd like to be the first to let you know that the pool is going to be open tomorrow. So I, I, no, that was a major bummer to me. I want to sit outside, but it's, it's going to be open. Um, Anti, I just want to say a, a minute, uh, just a brief thing about the American Academy of Anti-Aging. I just finished a two-year fellowship there. This was founded by actually a DO um, and a, an alumni of my school in, in Des Moines, Ron Klatt. Some of you, I've really enjoyed getting to know a lot of you, by the way, and some of you actually graduated from Des Moines. And uh, it's a huge uh, uh, academy. They have conferences all over the world in Dubai and Las Vegas and Thailand and such. Um, I have to say they have some very good um, education. I think the, the conferences are very good. But if you're interested in um, alternative medicine at all, uh, diagnosing uh, basic physiologic and nutritional imbalances that can lead to disease, the conferences are very good. But I, I, actually, overall, they're a little bit kind of into money overall. I don't tell anybody I said that. But um, the fellowships are phenomenal. The, the education that you get there um, in the fellowships is, is second to none, and I've really enjoyed that. Um, so nutrition and lifestyle intervention, I'm not, actually not used to using two different, so if I start getting dizzy here, I might just have to use one. If it doesn't mean I don't love you guys over here, but I might have to use just, uh, just one, uh, one screen. Um, nutrition and lifestyle intervention for weight management disease prevention. I found my passion. Um, you know, does it, does it remind you of anything? It sees as the body is in balance, and if it receives everything it needs from its micro environment of nutrition and so forth, it could heal itself. Does that remind you of anything? Okay, I need to, okay, I've got the slides working. I think that sounds like osteopathic philosophy, and as Greg was saying, I think as DOs, I'd like to invite you to consider that we are, we are as DOs, perfectly poised. Um, I went to osteopathic school because I love the osteopathic philosophy, and I know a lot of you did too. Um, but again, I think I would like to invite you to take a little bit closer look at this and, um, and consider maybe some ways that you might be able to implement uh, some, some of this into your practice. We'd like to take kind of a 20,000-foot view of, of, um, of, of, of your practice and the people that you're seeing with these conditions. Nancy, uh, I would like to just invite you, if you're a family practice, this, I, these are not all from my patient base, so I don't have all of the statistics, lab values, and so forth that I would normally have. But just imagine you're in family practice, and Nancy walks in, and she comes in for her physical, and she's uh, a little bit overweight, and she's on Prilosec and, because for reflux, and she's on a couple of antidepressants. A couple of months ago, she was unable to leave her house because she was so depressed was in bed a lot, and you're finally controlling her um, anxiety and depression with um, a couple of antidepressants. And, you know, you feel good about that. You're, you're controlling things. Jim comes in to you, the cardiologist. Maybe uh, you're the cardiologist who discovered that he actually had sleep apnea, which, of course, we know can contribute to the um, uh, ongoing, uh, the connections are fuzzy, but we know there's a connection with heart disease. So 
You've got his uh, glucose and lipids balanced. He's on a couple of meds for that, and statin. Um, and uh, the only thing really off is he's got a little bit of a fatty liver. And you say, you know what, Jim, it would be great if you could lose a little weight. Uh, this person is, uh, comes in for a, a, a physical, um, is on Prilosec, is a little bit um, pre-hypertensive, and has GERD and has been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagitis. So, meanwhile, does this remind you of your practice? You're, you're just cruising along and you're seeing these people and you're keeping them, um, you're, you're seeing one after another, it comes in with these various sort of comorbidities, things aren't quite right, and you just get somebody um, pulled out of the water, you know, you, you save them from the brink or maybe they're, uh, they've got soaring hypertension and you get them back on the ground and next thing you know, there's uh, three more coming in after them. Um, does that sound like your practice sometimes? It's just, they just keep coming, darn it. I mean, <laughs> all of these people with all of these problems. Um, so we're going to talk about, again, uh, try to look at a 20,000 foot view of the problem and then try to refocus our lens on some possible solutions to these problems that we're seeing. First, I'd like to define the scope of the problem. I won't spend too much time because you guys uh, know this. I spend a lot of time talking to patients about it, but um, I'd like to then talk about the efficacy of some of the current treatment options. Um, there are a lot of different things out there. We're going to talk about that dreaded behavior modification topic. And then, you know, a lot of docs are used to using it. Does anybody here use the food pyramid? No, okay, good. <laughs> I had uh, the Iowa Osteopathic Medical Association, when I spoke there, they wanted to know about the food pyramid. So I've got a few slides on that. I won't spend long on them, um, but we'll, we'll just touch on that. And then the glycemic index. The glycemic index um, is very important. Well, we'll wait till we get there to talk about it, and then we'll talk about some case, uh, some case histories. At the end, if we have time, I'd like to just talk about a few other specific nutritional considerations. So what are the perceived problems for the healthcare provider? First of all, time. Um, you know, when I was in school, uh, in the years ago, um, there, were not, there was not a lot of research on nutrition. Was there? I mean, well, okay, I'll admit, 83. I mean, in the early 80s, there was not a lot of research yet on nutrition. But now there's just an avalanche. Uh, it's hard to keep up with it all. It's hard to assess all of the tools. There's so many things out there. Uh, money. I mean, how do you spend, uh, how do you get reimbursed for spending time to talk to people uh, about this, which leads to the third one, time. So it's money, it's time, I mean, it's time, it's money, and it's time, right? There are managed care restrictions. You've got to see so many people in a certain amount of uh, time and so forth. And I would say, I would, I would t like to tell you today that if your patients had their choice, they would like you to help them with their with their nutritional assessment and their weight loss. I have patients all the time who come in and say they're so glad that somebody can act, a healthcare provider can actually work with them on this. So we've got some conflicts here. Um, the problems for our patients, it's a hostile world out there. Um, the people, anybody, if you were to ask the next patients that you saw all next week uh, to grade themselves on stress levels, zero to 10, what do you think it would be on average? Yeah, I mean, nine. And, you know, we're all under stress, but it's contributing to some very uh, bad uh, lifestyle habits and, and conditions. Uh, the food industry is not helping. There's a wonderful documentary, Food.Inc., if you haven't seen it, talks about how the um, uh, food industry is actually, you know, their, their job is to sell food, right? So they're very good at con combining just fats and sugars and salts in just the right way to addict us all to uh, their food. Cheap, unhealthy foods are everywhere. Um, you know, concession or uh, those machines with the food. What do you call them? Thank you, vending machines, and uh, and of course, fast food um, places are everywhere. So it's very, very easy to get cheap and nutritionally uh, anemic uh, food at every turn. Portion sizes are out of control. Technology is reducing daily expenditure, and the public is losing confidence. Um, they're just, I mean, they've tried so many things. They're gimmicks and fads, and they've tried it all. It doesn't work. And I would like to suggest perhaps, maybe not you, but a lot of physicians are becoming a little bit cynical, too, about whether their ability to help their patients change their lifestyle for many of the reasons we just discussed. Okay, portion sizes. I asked my parent, patients, go into your grandmother's cupboard and look at the dinner plates. They were like eight inches. Go to Pier 1 or, a, you know, a department store now, they're like, frickin' chargers, you know, they're just huge. Uh, so you put a little bit of food on there and people don't feel like they're eating much. Uh, Super Size Me, a movie came out, anybody see that? 
Yeah, it was good. Um, and uh, because of that movie, McDonald's now does not have supersize. They don't call it supersize. Um, but I've got... And, and we've got here an extra value meal quarter pounder with cheese, a supersized fries, and a supersized drink. Gives you now um, 1,550 uh, calories. And um, originally, when, when we were kids, it was about 600 calories for a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. I went on to, actually went on to McDonald's website this morning so I could um, readjust adjust this a little bit. If you, had a, if you went to McDonald's and had a quarter pounder with cheese, a large fry, and like a small chocolate shake as you're trying to cut back, right? Uh, that would be uh, 1,680 calories, 61 grams of fat, and 1,730 1, milligrams of sodium. And I think I'll have an apple pie because I've been so good. I'm just going to reward myself. That takes calories to 1,930 almost a day, a day's worth of calories, 74 grams of fat, and 1,900 milligrams of, of sodium. So, you know, I, will, I live near, next to a McDonald's. I walk by when I go on a walk, and I don't care what time of day it is, there's always somebody in line at McDonald's. So um, that's, that's a problem. Joel Furman, in present day society, we are experiencing a modern form of malnutrition never before known in modern history. Um, you know, it makes me wonder about uh, if A.T. Still was alive today, what would he think that we are the most affluent, um, abundant, abundant society uh, ever in the history of mankind, and yet we are suffering malnutrition. There are people who, there are some theories actually that chronic disease are all diseases that start with some micronutrient uh, deficiencies. And I wouldn't, I, obviously that's my focus and I'm, I'm very aware of that. Unfortunately, uh, our population is making food choices for themselves and their children virtually unaware of the risk they're taking. I mean, you know, they have these statistics at McDonald's, they're available, but I don't know anybody who knows this when they're eating there. So now it's finish your Pepsi and Cheetos or you don't get dessert. A friend of mine is a radiation oncologist in St. Louis. She has a friend who went into the middle schools in St. Louis and walked around taking pictures of the kids' trays. This is a literal, actual picture from a middle school student's lunch tray. And it was typical. It's scary. So, okay, you don't need to know, I mean, you already know this, obesity is, obesity is the prevailing nutritional problem, uh, primary uh, 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 lifestyle problem that is afflicting our patients right now, linked to 30 major diseases. How many of the patients you saw last week had one or more of these situations? What percentage? 90%? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's scary. Uh, New England Journal, I can't give you the exact citation for this, but uh, uh, 40 pounds overweight, they report heart attack risk goes up 360%, diabetes 2,000, hypertension 260, cancer 80, premature death by 110. Obesity, CDC says it's becoming such a problem that many experts say, now say it's compromising all the benefits of recent improvements in healthcare and medical breakthroughs. This is also my pet passion for our reform healthcare uh, program. This, I had to change this slide uh, just a few weeks ago because until then I had a slide that said here, um, obesity is poised to overtake smoking as the number one preventable cause of death. As of January 5th, and this report from the American Journal of Preventive Medicine has now overtaken smoking as the number one preventable cause of death in this country. Children, of course, you all know this, in the last 20 years type 2 diabetes has increased tenfold, asthma is up, other diseases. Um, many of which we already are aware of direct nutritional, environmental, and stress-related relationships. David Katz from Yale University of Prevention Medicine says in the next 10 years, 16 and 17-year-olds will be dying of heart disease, and this is the first generation that is expected to have a shorter lifespan than their parents. Isidore Rosenfeld from Sloan Kettering, almost every medical condition is either caused by or affected in some way by what we eat. This is a, uh, a graph, um, not sure of the uh, origination of this graph, but basically it shows that diabetes has increased over 100% between 1997 and 2007. There's a Canadian who's actually termed a new word, diabesity. Has anybody heard of that? You have, back there? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's an epidemic. Both are an epidemic. These are uh, some common slides. Many of you have probably seen these slides from the CDC. I'm going to just fly through them really quick just to make a point. On the left, you'll see the 
and we don't need to pay very close attention to the actual numbers. All you'll need to know is that as the, it gets darker, the percentage of patients with obesity, that is a BMI of greater than 30 in the individual states. And on the right, it'll be interesting to see slight lag, but a distinct overlap with the obesity states and the rising incidence of, of diabetes. So I'm just going to uh, fly through these, and it's, I think it's quite dramatic. A little bit of a lag on the diabetes, but it's close behind. And you can see a prevalence in the Southwest. The mid Midwest is, you know, California's holding its own, but uh, Midwest is catching up, and uh, that's the last slide I have on that. People are falling in the river because we have a hole in the bridge. How can you be a pioneer in prevention and prevent that hole in the bridge is what we want to talk about. Um, we need to start providing as osteopaths health care services. We do not have a health care system. We have a disease management program. And um, I would like to encourage you to um, start thinking about prevention as more than just early detection. So down to brass tacks. What works? What doesn't work? Well, everybody would likely say you need to eat less and exercise more. Um, and this is, again, this, this is Greg, our last speaker. And we again, we've uh, met many of you um, already here. But um, he's going to come up and give you a, a short uh, talk about his experience um, with, with exercise. Oh, he's not here. OK. I, see, I think he's going to show up later. He was going to talk about this. Um, he had a strong family history of uh, overweight, diabetes, and heart disease. His father had an MI at both at 41 and again at 51. He had tried everything. His doctor had told him to eat less and exercise more. And the year that this picture was taken, he had run three triathlons. He was eating uh, two meals a day. And he had, in that year, he lost three pounds. OK? So um, exercise alone uh, doesn't do it. And uh, I think he's going to come up and share his story again in a little bit. Uh, but macronutrient manipulation as well doesn't work. So when people come to you and they're going to go on a diet and they say, OK, I, I think I'll just cut back on my carbs or, or go on a low-fat diet. Well, we had the low-fat craze. That was popular when I was in school. And Nathan Pritikin actually did a very good job showing that you can actually reverse atherosclerosis with extremely low-fat diets. However, what the food industry did is they replaced the fat with sugar and nobody lost weight, or every, obesity rates increased, I should say, during this particular phase. Now there's, the low, there's also the low carb, there's the Atkins South Beach. I actually like the South Beach program quite a bit. Um, but again, it's a, not a, it's a dangerous long-term solution. It's not a long-term solution. When you restrict the amount of carbs, the body needs carbohydrates. It needs low glycemic, good quality carbohydrates. But when you do that for a prolonged period of time and then go off of that, the body will then crave carbohydrates. And then you have an over, have you seen that in your practice? People go off the Atkins and then they just can't get enough carbs. It's the body's way of trying to get back into balance. So again, these, uh, the other thing that I don't like about the, uh, the, you know, this, the uh, high protein, low carb is you're missing uh, the micronutrient um, phytochemicals from fruits and vegetables sometimes for a very long period of time. So it's not a long term solution. Diets don't work. We don't even allow the word in, uh, in our practice. Medicare did an exhaustive search a few years back to try to find something that they could actually reimburse for. And their conclusion was that there is little support for the notion that diets lead to lasting weight loss or health benefits. What are the main reasons for relapse? And we know that 85 to 90, 95% of people who go on a diet gain the weight back again, and often more than they had lost in the beginning. Um, what are the problems with that and why does that happen? One of the main reasons is it's a, it's a mindset. It's a temporary thing. Usually when you say you're going to go on a diet, in the back of your mind you're thinking, and then when I get to my goal weight, I'll go off the diet. Meantime, nothing has changed. They ate grapefruit for six months, they lost weight, then they go back to their you know, bonbons and, and uh, Big Macs. So um, again, nothing has changed in the long term. It's not a long term solution. Um, wrong strategy, again, they're trying to manipulate their foods and so forth. Uh, dietary counseling, if you do anything for your patients, if you have time, you might send them to a nutritionist. I actually had a nutritionist tell me that um, 
What she does is basically vomit all over people. <laughs> Great visual. Um, but, you know, nutritionists, God bless them, they do good work, but they usually give all these, you know, 10 pages of things. Do this, don't do that. You know, stock this, don't stock this. Patients go home and they read the stuff and they, they work at it for a couple of weeks and then it becomes overwhelming. So um, the generalities of eat less and exercise more is ineffective. And now we also know that um, dietary counseling is also very ineffective. And it's, and it's complicated. Trying to integrate these things into your life over time, making big changes over time, is very difficult for most people. Most low-calorie diets cause uh, some uh, muscle loss, sarcopenia, as well as fat. So they can be dangerous. And if, if something else is not quite as fast, they get you know, they get discouraged because they're not losing weight as fast as they want. And that combined with the stresses of life and the easy accessibility of, of nutritionally void uh, high calorie food is, is just gets them in the, it, it makes it done work. It doesn't work. Uh, then there's flavor fatigue. Sometimes people get bored. So we have pharmaceuticals. We have bariatric surgery. I put a question mark. That works. Uh, Yes, sometimes people can lose weight with pharmaceuticals. Um, however, it's again, I don't believe it's a long-term solution because if you're not teaching people habits, new habits of health, these uh, pharmaceuticals won't work. And of course, we know most of them, even the good ones that work, have side effects. Um, even, I mean, we're, even one that's not on there for Meridia, of course, is hypertension. It's not even on there. Most of you know what most of these are. And of course, bariatric surgery. This varies a lot by geographic region, but you can have in some areas as many as one in 300 that can die following uh, bypass surgery. And sometimes very high as much as 40%, depending again on the location, certainly not in this area, I'm sure, um, will experience complications such as internal bleeding, organ damage, bowel leakage, and hernias. Not to mention the uh, protein malnourishment, the muscle wasting, and the inability to absorb certain nutrients afterwards. Specifically, um, one very glaring one, of course, calcium absorption goes down, and these people need to be on supplements for life. So the prognosis um, after bariatric surgery, it's very similar to what you would want them to do anyway. They still have to make significant lifestyle changes. So I go to people and I say, okay, uh, you know, and a lot of insurance companies will say you have to try some program or some sort of weight loss program before you undergo the surgery. And I say, okay, you're going to have to eat this way anyway. So why don't we try this now before uh, you entertain the idea of the surgery? You can't have carbonated drinks. High sugar and fat can cause all kinds of unpleasant side effects after surgery, uh, bypass the supplements they need to take forever. And there's a high, surprisingly high recidivism. Um, I have a uh, patient who lost 120 pounds on, uh, b with bariatric surgery, gained it all back. And now she's lost it with our program again, and she's made the changes she needed to make in the first place. So I love to save people from surgery. I'm, a, I'm an osteopath. Oh, excuse me. They're good surgeons that are osteopaths. Uh, but natural is the best way, of course. Um, we know that calorie restriction works. In fact, calorie restriction is probably one of the most widely um, studied um, ways and venues that has proven most definitively to reverse and slow the process of aging, sometimes reverse. Uh, I've got a couple, I'm sorry I don't have a whole lot of studies in these areas, but I picked out what I could in the time that I've got. Um, here's a study from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. They've had 18 people uh, who on a self-imposed calorie restriction, and it's not even that dramatic. Some of them is down as low as 1,100, but up to almost 2,000 calories a day for three to 15 years. And then 18 people on a standard average American diet, 2,000, around 2,000 to 3,500 calories a day. And the results are pretty much what you would expect. Um, you know, lipids, uh, pretty significant P values are great, blood pressure down, uh, glucose, insulin down, and um, most important, C reactive protein. Um, this, um, you know, there are some limitations to this study, and as much as we don't know, maybe the people who self imposed a lower calorie diet also chose healthier foods. They may have been more physically active and so forth. But I think it's still interesting uh, to look at that. So what are the effects of, um, of reduced calorie, uh, re excuse me, of, of calorie restriction? There's a reduced uh, rate of growth. There's increased formation of mitochondria. There's enhanced DNA stability and a reduce, reduction of age-related immune function senescence. OK, we also happen to know that um, Portion-controlled meal replacements do work. Um, 
In uh, 2003, uh, reported in the International Journal of Obesity-Related Diseases, they uh, did, had a meta and pooling analysis from six different studies. And uh, they concluded that these types of interventions can safely and eff effectively produce significant sustainable weight loss and improve weight-related risk factors of disease. We have a study here from Johns Hopkins. It was an 18-month study that used the Metafast diabetic low glycemic portion control meal replacements and compared it to the American Diabetes Association diet. And the, uh, the Metafast diabetic was the maintenance plan. It wasn't the weight loss plan. It was a higher calorie to match the ADA's uh, weight uh, program. It's very interesting. 112 people uh, divided into a control group, uh, 56, who spent 34 weeks on the ADA uh, program. Uh, diet and 56 who went into with the um, Metafast diabetic por uh, meal re partial meal replacements, and uh, and then they did the uh, the uh, test group uh, did a, um, a double group six uh, six months uh, half of them did P uh, PCMRs maintenance program uh, while the other half of those group of that group did the ADA maintenance and then there was a crossover component and the findings I think was uh, very interesting but overall. The data showed that there were significantly higher health benefits from PCMRs than there was from the ADA recommended diabetic diet. And um, in a nutshell, the meal replacement participants uh, sustained an average of 9% decrease in their fasting glucose, 19% decrease in insulin, 12% decrease in fasting triglycerides, 9% increase in HDL, their blood pressure decreased significantly, improved health-related uh, quality of life, and I highlighted this because I think it's significant that 24% of them, I guess you can't even see that too well with the red, I apologize, um, using the meal replacements actually were able to reduce or eliminate their diabetic medication compared to 0% on the ADA program. If there's anybody here who works with the ADA, I apologize, but can't argue with this. So not all meal replacements are the same. What would you uh, be looking for in a, in a healthy meal replacement? First of all, you want a healthy balance of all the macronutrients. It can't just be high protein. Um, we know that protein-carb balance is very important. You need a good amount of fat. You need good quality fat. Uh, protein levels need to be adequate and bioavailable. It needs to have a low glycemic index, and it needs to be low calorie. So we also know that small, frequent, low glycemic meals work. So nibbling versus gorging, this is a, I don't know how this got published, actually it's pretty dinky, but it was in the New England Journal, so I'm going to tell you about it. Um, they compared the metabolic advan advantages of, of increased meal frequency versus, as in 17 snacks a day versus three bigger meals a day. And there were only seven guys, and they were randomly as uh, assigned to one of those two groups. Um, each diet was followed for only two weeks, again, not a very long time. Uh, but compared to the three meal a day, these nibblers um, had a much improved cholesterol, LDL, and ApoB. So they, they concluded from this that the frequency of meals may be an important determinant of fasting serum lipid levels, possibly in relation to changes in insulin. Um, we have some other interesting data on meal frequency coming up. but. Basically, if your patients are eating frequent meals uh, already, uh, chances are either their portion size is too high and or they're eating a high glycemic uh, food. And this is a slide I use when I'm giving seminars to my patients. Um, a lot of physicians shy away from um, teaching people about the glycemic index. They think it's too complicated and patients can't get it. But I'm telling you, when I show them this slide, they, are, they really get it. Um, they have an orange, do you have an orange juice in the morning? Your sugar goes up, it's a very high glycemic uh, index on orange juice. Uh, in other words, it raises your blood sugar very quickly, it's followed by a rapid insulin response. You guys all know this. Um, and you know, so they get tired and then around 10 o'clock they have a bagel. And uh, again, a high glycemic food, the insulin, glucose insulin pump is, is turned on again followed by maybe a hamburger, soft drink for lunch, a candy bar mid-afternoon. And, and when I explain this to patients and they, they think about you know, that sugar crash they get, this, this really explains it to them and they, and they can really understand why now they're having that happen. Um, so what we're gearing up for and what we're trying to teach patients is how to, how to shut off that insulin pump. 
because as you know, of course, insulin causes increased deposition of body fat, especially the visceral adiposity, which leads to the production of cytokines and other inflammatory markers that lead to degenerative, all these degenerative diseases. Um, so this is the goal to, um, to give small, frequent, low glycemic meals uh, to shut off that insulin pump and, and, uh, and decrease their risk of disease that way. In a recent study of diabetic women, C-reactive protein levels were 32 percent higher if they were eating a high glycemic uh, index program rather than low glycemic meals. I thought that was very interesting. So you guys know what the glycemic index, none of my patients know this. I'll ask anybody who heard of glycemic index. Nobody's even heard of it. So we're not teaching them, but I think it's very easy to do that. Um, it's, I tell them that it's the numerical index given to a carbohydrate-rich food that's based on the average increase in blood glucose. Of course, the previous slide with the graph is much more um, uh, descriptive. So a lower glycemic index then equates with lower insulin, better long-term glucose control, lower lipids, and of course, lower inflammation overall. This is my mother, and um, she only wanted to lose a few pounds. She really wasn't that heavy. She was 83. 82 when this picture was taken, and she, she lost 15 pounds and began eating these small, low glycemic meals frequently throughout the day. I got her off all three of her hypoglycemic medications. Anybody taken anybody off of uh, all of their diabetic medications lately? Anybody? <laughs> I can't tell you how fun it is to do that, folks. Um, and a lot of your patients will say, you know, once they're told they have diabetes, they're told they have it for life. You know, it's, it's, you're just going to have to accept it, and here's the ADA program. You send them to the nutritionist and, um, and so forth, and they're, you know, having to monitor their, their sugars, and, uh, and they don't get off medications. I'm taking people off diabetic medications. I told my mother, you know what? You don't have diabetes anymore. She still checks her sugar, and if she goes out, she still has to follow that control a little bit, and every once in a while she'll take a glucophage or something if she goes out for a birthday cake or something, but uh, it, basically on a general rule, she's not having to take that. Here's a really wonderful tool, and I want to make this available to you guys. One of the things we do is give our patients a way to download these wonderful little cards. They're color-coded, and they can actually take them to the grocery store, and whether it's vegetables or cereals or uh, fruits, what, have, what have you, they can actually see the green zone are, are things that are lower glycemic, that are safe to eat liberally, and then the yellow, uh, yellow zone are the foods that they shouldn't uh, buy so much or eat so frequently. Um, I want to give you a way to, to download those. If you go to habitsofhealth.net and click on resources, you can find those glycemic index cards that you can actually print out and give to your patients. It's a wonderful tool. So here we go back to our, our uh, case studies. This is Nancy in the family practice office. Uh, we got her uh, to lose 37 pounds. Now she got off of her uh, over-the-counter uh, omeprazole as well as both of her antidepressants. Now how many of you think about weight loss and, and um, optimal health and lifestyle and everything with getting people actually off antidepressants? Great, one person. It's, it's something that I think a lot of us don't think of. And I think that when you, there are many, not, I mean not always, obviously, but many times when you are improving the basic underlying physiology of your patients, you're going to be able to improve their neurotransmitters, for pity's sake, right? I mean, uh, it's not just because she was happy she lost weight. She was, but her whole life changed. And her, um, uh, her, whole physi her basic physiology and biochemistry changed as a result of learning some new habits of health. It's very reassuring. Anybody knew that that was me? That's me. Uh, and see, the other thing that's really great when your patients learn habits of health, they get a fashion sense. You see, it just, it's a joke, you guys. You wait. Um, I, I'm embarrassed to show this slide. It's, it's kind of, it, it is embarrassing, but I had a bad attitude when I was experimenting with this program that I use now. So I, I said to my daughter, we were going to do it together, and I said, Psh. Uh, this is so stupid, and you're supposed to wear stupid clothes when you take your before pictures. Let me go put on something stupid, and I tell you, I have lived to regret that day. Um, I tell all my patients now, take your before picture, but wear nice clothes. You never know who's going to be seeing it. So anyway, I did lose 48 pounds, and I don't take Prilosec anymore, and my blood pressure, I've become much, health, much healthier blood pressure. 
And then here's Jim in the cardiologist's office. And uh, the cardiologist was very happy with that lab before, but look what happened after he lost 50 pounds. Uh, his glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides went down even further, uh, and he's off of his uh, two uh, antihypertensives as well as his statin. And not only that, his liver uh, fat is, is down. His uh, liver enzymes have normalized. There's actually some interesting uh, new research that may be, that's starting to suggest that there may even be greater harm from uh, fatty liver, um, just plain fatty liver, and not even non-alcoholic steatorrhea, but um, a, a fatty liver than, than even visceral fat. I think um, the jury's still out, but getting somebody's uh, liver enzymes to normalize is always a nice thing. Okay, so they've lost weight with low glycemic uh, portion control meal replacements. That's not the end of the story. Um, so what we do in, in basically is, is begin the transition from uh, meal replacements to eating more healthy food, basically. Uh, education along the way uh, leads to, among other things, the understanding of how to put together a healthy plate of food. And this is basically what we teach them. Um, the, oh, that pointer doesn't work too, oh yeah, it works. Half their plate should be vegetables and fruits, okay? A, a quarter of it should be protein, and another quarter should be starches, or a complex carbohydrate, preferably. So that's sort of where we start. Now here's the food pyramid stuff that none of you is interested in. <laughs> so um, I'll just r run through it. The old one was really bad. Uh, so in 2005, there's another one, and uh, it's, it's not any much, well here are the improvements. It has a new emphasis on weight control. Uh, it no longer considers all fats as bad. Uh, trans fats and saturated fats are discouraged, but there's no artificial cap on total fat, and the, instead of complex carbohydrates, it limits sugar and emphasizes whole grains. Uh, the problems are many actually, and I got this from Harvard. Harvard did a great study, a review of this new food pyramid, um, and you can find it online if you want, but it suggests, the new one suggests that it's uh, fine to eat half your grains as refined starch, uh, regarding it lumps all protein together, no, notwithstanding uh, uh, the different kinds of fat, and just judges by total fat. It also ignores the mounting evidence that eating less red meat offers numerous health benefits. And the other really wacky thing is it recommends three glasses of milk a day, ignoring the millions of people in this country with lactic acid, uh, excuse me, lactose intolerance, the lack of evidence for a link between consumption of dairy foods and um, Consum and risk of, decreased risk of osteoporosis. The, there are so many w other ways to get calcium uh, than milk and dairy foods, of course, leafy greens being the huge one. And the possible, they ignore the possible increased risk of prostate and ovarian cancer with increased dairy food consumption. Not only that, does anybody know, looking at this thing, what that means? I mean, there's no way you can look at it and get an idea, so you have to go to this website, and that leaves out all the millions that do not have um, do not have computers in this country. Um, it's reviewed every five years, and it, the decisions that this, this is actually, you may be not using it, but this affects how billions of dollars are spent every year, especially, uh, for instance, in the school lunch program. And the panelists who go into deciding what this is going to look like every five years or so are chosen under a heavy amount of pressure from an intense lobbying from the likes of the National Dairy Council, United Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Association, the Soft Drink Association, American Meat Institute, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and the Wheat Foods Council. More TLC from our corporate, um, corporate world. So we know that behavior modification works. I really like this study. Over 3,000 non-diabetic people with elevated fasting and post-load uh, plasma glucose concentrations were compared to placebo, uh, metformin, 850 BID, or a lifestyle modification program. And the goal for that lifestyle modification program was a 7% weight loss with at least 150 minutes of physical activity a week, about 30 minutes, five times a day. The average follow-up was almost three years. And they both decreased, um, reduced the incidence of, of diabetes um, significantly, 58% uh, um, with lifestyle, 31% from, from metformin. So the conclusion then is that lifestyle intervention was actually more effective than metformin in reducing the um, incidence of diabetes. So, one of the uh, first ways that we start teaching people um, about how to um, develop healthy habits is 
is we went to the National Weight Control Registry. Has anybody heard of this study at the University of Colorado? Um, it's been going on for several years now. It started in 1993. Uh, over, I think it's closer to 6,000 people now who have been studied in this. But basically the criteria is that anybody who is in the study had to have lost on average 50 pounds and kept it off on average for over five years on their own. Remember the five to 15 percent of people who don't gain back their weight? These are the people. And they interview all of them and ask them what they did. And at this point, this is the point, I wanted uh, to ask Greg to come back up and uh, talk to you a little bit about how he's incorporated these, um, these particular strat strategies to um, the results that he's had. Thanks, Dr. Child. Well, for me, when I decided to go into you know, preventive medicine as a business consultant, I needed to walk the talk. I knew that right away I should take a hold of my health, because if I was going to be an ambassador of wellness, I needed to you know, live it. And so I started looking at the results, and the results were a lot of studies were based on what's not working. You know, the stats are scary. You know, 85 to 90 percent of people gain the weight back. But this study was very unique, and it was those people, that 10 to 15 percent of people who had lost significant weight, and were successful in keeping it off for years. So the research that, that I started following was very, very simple. Um, when you boil down the data, if you go to the next slide, mm -hmm. when you boil down the data, there are just a handful of very specific commonalities that show up in the database. I'm in part of this study. I, vol I actually volunteered to participate in the study once I reached my five-year mark of losing 50 pounds. And um, what they do is they send you an exhaustive pamphlet of information. It's about a 200 question questionnaire that's, uh, that you're uh, going to go through. It takes an hour or two to complete. And then there's a second follow-up phase where they actually send you a monitor and they, they, they remind you throughout the day to track certain things. And they're asking you to compile this information, not subjectively, but real time as it's coming up in your mind. And they're correlating all this data. And what they found is that there's a couple of commonalities, one of them being eating breakfast. I think it was 96% of the participants in that study had breakfast every single day. Uh, that's been a habit of mine that I've started. Now, prior to that, when I was in my overweight, I was skipping meals. I was eating more, eating less by skipping meals and exercising more by running triathlons. And it didn't work. So I started eating breakfast regularly. I had already had the habit of exercise. The challenge was is with the extra weight, it was causing problems with my joints, and I ended up um, tearing my meniscus. But I continue to exercise now. I still exercise at least four or five times a week, as do the people in the study, um, monitoring my weight. I used to not own a scale. In that old picture, when I was overweight, the, I found out I was obese when I went to the doctor to get an immunization shot because I was going traveling to a, a foreign country. I had no idea I was overweight, and I know a lot of your patients are the same. So monitoring, ongoing, and there's two things. The monitoring is not only for self-monitoring, but also having somebody to be accountable with. So my doctor that I work with was keeping me accountable. Watching less TV, you know, cutting back, that's obvious, it's sedentary lifestyle, but also eating that five or six uh, small frequent meals, and, and Dr. Child really explained that. And that's been a habit of mine that I started, I continue uh, to this day, six or seven meals on a busy day. If I'm running and busy, the thing is, is my portion sizes are dramatically smaller, and I believe that by shutting down the insulin pump, by using the low glycemic meal replacements that I use, that's made a huge difference in my body's ability to burn fat. If you think about it, a, a performing athlete, somebody who's a high-performing athlete, will always be in a mild state of ketosis because their calories in are very close to their calories out. And that's basically uh, how I feel every day. Now I'm hungry every three hours, whereas before, I could go all day and not be hungry because my metabolism was so shut down. So these habits are very effective, and I'm really, um, it's changed my life. So I'm excited to, uh, to be a, a, a guinea pig and, and now a, a, a spokesperson. Great. Thanks, Greg. So basically, uh, this is what our program looks like. Uh, in the beginning, calories in is much more than calories out. We put them on a drastically reduced uh, caloric intake. We don't uh, start out with much exercise. If they're exercising already, we cut it in half a little bit to get them acclimated to the lower calories. Uh, and get them used to that. And then there's some dramatic weight loss um, with that particular pr uh, plant phase. Uh, then once they've reached equilibrium, they've reached their goal weight, then we slowly start adding back calories. We re increase their uh, calorie expenditure. And then, uh, then we optimize. We, we, we take them into even a greater state of health. And then hopefully longevity-wise, we've taught them these habits for life. Uh, the first thing, of course, that goes is the belly fat. I, meant, I forgot to mention. 
briefly a busy slide just uh, run through this. So basically, the current state of health for your patients, they're storing fat. Their insulin levels are high. They're in an pro-inflammatory state. Their BMI is high, and they're, they're practicing habits of disease. Okay, and so when you, then you put them into this phase one, they put them into a fat burning state, weight starts coming off really rapidly, their insulin stabilizes, they decrease the inflammatory state uh, by the low glycemic meal replacements, um, BMI is decreasing healthy and they're learning healthy and eating activities um, and healthy habits. Phase two then, as we're um, getting them to uh, increase all of this, we start adding some muscle resistance, we increase their activity level, uh, we can add uh, some resistance training, nothing big, we just go slowly so that the people have time to get used to this and incorporate this into their lifestyle and actually make it permanent. Um, their, their insulin again now is normalized, their C-reactive protein is under one, hopefully their BMI is hopefully under 25, of course BMI again we take with a grain of salt, um, but that's, it's a good marker, we're using it, uh, and we're teaching them the habits of health. As we go into optimization, uh, we even increase that we can, we can add things. Maybe somebody wants to run a marathon. They can may start training there. We keep them focused on the future. We keep them focused on continuing to optimize their health. It's not an end point. Being healthy is not an end point. And when we teach people, again, get away from that temporary mindset, oh, I want to look good for the wedding this summer, nuh-uh, that won't work. When we teach them that it's a process and they're going to be constantly moving through these phases to their old age, it really makes sense to them. And if they can make that fundamental choice to become a healthy person, which is what we encourage them, uh, this, is the, this, is, this is what happens. Okay, and so in uh, phase, uh, uh, phase three, uh, again, their insulin is low, their C-reactive protein may be even lower. And then longevity, we're, we're really uh, optimizing their health. Uh, BMI, ideally, maybe between 20 and 24 as well. And uh, we've, we've actually changed someone's life. And, and that's, to me, as a physician, this is, this is more fun than a doctor is supposed to have, i got to tell you. <laughs> okay, I'm having fun doing this. And um, I'm very, talking about Greg talking about passionate. This is, this is my passion. I, I've never had so much fun getting people. It's truly, to me, osteopathic. You know, I'm, I'm helping people, edu educating them and empowering them to take control of their lives. And it's more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Uh, so some tools we use, um, a BMI chart uh, we use uh, in the office. We use an Omron body composition, fat, fat analysis. I had somebody come tell me that they find that that Omron is not very accurate when you get into very morbidly obese people. I have not had anybody yet like that, four or 500 pounds. So that may be true, but we're finding it as a good tool to monitor progress. Uh, we use a textbook, Habits of Health, where they can go, uh, where we actually, actually ask them to learn and study. Uh, so we have even had a book uh, study group going that was uh, very helpful for a lot of people. Uh, we have websites that they use and a lot of other tools. A lot of physicians will use group meetings, like every couple of weeks they'll have a little support group meeting, maybe run by a staff member or something in the office, so people can get support from other people. Um, this is a uh, mindful eating uh, scale uh, chart that we can hand out to our patients. It gives them some idea to start thinking about when do you actually eat. We want them to stay away from the red zones, which is the empty on the bottom two, one and two, is they're ravenous or they're starving, you don't feel good, you don't want to get down that low. You want to get down to where you're hungry, where eating would be pleasant, but you could wait a little longer. We tell them to eat there, and then eat until they're first, um, until they're satisfied, content at like uh, number six, uh, where this meter is, is, is pointing now, your stomach feels, um, con you know, you're content, but you could, you, you should stop eating there. Uh, you don't, again, want to get into the red zone. And here's some coding, um, some different, this is, you can't read this, I'm sorry, but this is a, a coding sheet, and I actually have a copy of that hunger meter and the uh, ways to code some uh, lifestyle counts and weight management counseling sessions in your practice. We'll have those outside in the hall after the session if you'd like to pick up a copy. We're happy to share that with you. So additionally, a couple of um, additional uh, things that you want to take into uh, account, you may want to take into account that can certainly affect weight loss. Uh, thyroid, you need to have the thyroid balanced. And I would encourage you to think even in terms of treating if it's even low, within low normal and they're having symptoms of hypothyroid. Um, I found just, anybody here use armor? It's not bad anymore. And I found very good results with that. Um, taking even people are, are, are low normal thyroid, TSH maybe is 
um, you know, between 2 and 5 or something, and T3 and T4 are just within the lower half range of, of normal. A lot of times that can help with their metabolism and, and encourage weight loss. Allergies can cause people to uh, have weight uh, problems, so you want to address that. Uh, mood disorders, uh, of course, you need to address the psychological component. Pharmaceuticals. Uh, of course, if people are on various things that can cause weight gain, you've got to take that into effect, and we're going to try to get people off these things to help uh, with weight loss as well. Sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone imbalance, of course, the whole menopause thing with estrogen dominance and um, uh, low progesterone and so forth can affect uh, the adiposity, the visceral adiposity, so you want to address that. Sleep is hugely important. One of the first things we ask people is how many hours a night do you sleep? Um, of course, if they're not sleeping enough, or if they have a night shift, it's even harder. Um, but of course, when, you're, they're, when they're sleep deprived, their um, uh, leptin levels are, are too, um, too low and ghrelin's too high. Uh, so it affects hormones as well and, and, and causes um, a, a lot of other problems. It's a whole other topic, actually. Address their stress. I mean, if they're having stressful issues, that can affect their weight. Um, just throwing this in from the nutritional standpoint, not directly associated with weight loss, uh, but vitamin D is way more important, folks, than just osteo preventing osteoporosis. Um, it's another, again, it's another whole hour lecture, but um, there's an epidemic deficiency in this country, especially in the Midwest where I am. Maybe you don't see it as much here, but, um, you know, there's huge study associating deficiency of di vitamin D with breast cancer, uh, multiple sclerosis, congestive heart failure, and I'm seeing uh, mood disorders. I've seen some f uh, seasonal affective disorder responding dramatically to uh, vitamin D supplementation. And we, I heard remember the woman who spoke on osteoporosis said she uses two to 4,000 to begin with. I'm using 6,000 in the Midwest in the winter and then says, assessing again in a few months to see if that's enough. Um, of course, fish oil. People's uh, omega-3 fats are out of balance with their sixes. Uh, I almost always supplement people with EPA, DHA uh, combinations. It helps with inflammation and again, mood disorders. Uh, which can affect weight loss as well. Um, two, two, three other supplements that can directly help with thermogenesis and, and uh, uh, weight loss is L-carnitine, uh, conjugated linoleic acid, as well as, whoops, it didn't make it onto the slain, uh, slide, EGCG, the active ingredient in green tea, um, can also provide a uh, thermogenic lift or boost for people who are trying to um, lose weight. I just had to throw this in again because a lot of times people are not thinking about nutrient depletion, depletion from pharmaceuticals. There are many reasons we need to get people off drugs, uh, but a lot of us don't think about it. I would, for instance, sometimes the side effects of a medication, and you go to look at the nutrients that are depleted by that medication, and the symptoms of that deficiency are similar or identical to the side effects of the medication. Case in point, um, birth control pills, can, a, a, a rare side effect of that can be depression. Well, birth control pills deplete the, many v, of the B vitamins, 2, 3, 6, 12, I think, or uh, 2, 3, 12, um, yeah, maybe 6, as well as zinc, magnesium. Well, side effects of low magnesium and some B vitamins is depression, okay? Um, I, again, I just can't emphasize enough that as osteopaths, we really need to be looking at the nutritional status of our patients and trying to get them to eat healthier foods and get them off their drugs. I'd be happy to communicate with any of you at any more great length. This is my, uh, be in touch with me, get my, uh, my email written down and I'll be in the back, of course, to answer some more questions. So I would like to um, uh, invite you to join us. Um, the first era of medicine was from about the beginning of the 20th century, so to about the 50s. And that was the era of conquering infectious diseases. And we did that quite well. We've got vaccines and we're able to control infection quite, quite, quite amazingly. Um, the second era of medicine was technologically, we're technologically driven. We've increased our technological capacity. We have learned how to manage chronic disease and keep people alive, albeit not in great shape always, but keep people alive into quite a distance. Our longevity is going up for that reason. But the third era of medicine is just beginning, and the third era of medicine is the era, uh, is the era of optimal health and taking our patients to a state of optimal health, teaching and empowering them to take responsibility for their health and learning the habits of health. I would, I just implore you to consider taking advantage of this and joining us in this 
rising swell of the, um, the uh, third generation of medicine and become one of the new health professionals. Thank you very much. I guess I have to, there's some time for questions a little bit or not. Couple, anybody? Yes, sir. I was going to add that one of the things that may be not commonly known is that in 1975, the country had an enormous surplus of corn, and the Department of Agriculture went to the food processors and encouraged them to use uh, corn syrup as much as they could in their processing. And today, if you look at what's in <coughs> processed foods that you buy, very seldom will you find them without uh, corn syrup. Exactly, and, and high fructose corn syrup is not filling. It does not trigger satiety the way normal sugars do. Great point. How fast do you have to lose weight? A pound a week, a half a week? Well, on the, on the low calorie, with the, using some partial meal replacements, it, it's about two to five pounds a week in the beginning. And um, again, we have very little to no uh, sarcopenia involved with that, and uh, it's a mild ketosis. Um, so patients generally tolerate it, in fact, thrive on it. They feel very good uh, in, with that. In pink? Um, two questions. How much are the meals? What would it cost per month for the patient? And number two is, in California, where I'm having a hard time getting armor thyroid. Oh. They say they're not manufacturing it. Is there a way to get it to well, actually, as a matter of fact, right now, I think across the country, it's hit or miss with the manufacturing. I'm having the same thing. I'm actually compounding T3, T4 combinations to match the armor. I, I hope, I, yeah, I hope it, it's a, more available soon. And I can't really talk about anything having to do with the program specifically, but I'd be very happy to visit with you later about that. Okay. Yes? You know, I think it's a really valid topic. I can't speak to it. I'm sorry. I haven't really researched it enough. I have some opinions, but I hate to give it my opinions without really having more review of the literature. I think the jury may be out. I don't know. Do you have anything? Do you have you researched it yourself? Um, yeah, I, 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 I know people that are quite adamant about it in terms of it not being a good thing, uh, and then equally adamant on the opposite side of the fence. I think it's an excellent topic. I. Uh, I'd like to hear somebody else speak on that sometime. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Dr. The slide went too quickly. We got the first half of your email with the really Oh. Yes, sir. And then your partner mentioned that he wasn't hungry when he was overweight. Is that what he said? Read the comment. He said, I'm hungry. Yeah. You know, the Chinese consider it when you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry, that's not good. Chinese medicine, will, they'll tell you that. You need to be hungry when you wake up. But uh, you know, you can, if, you're, if, you, if you're not hungry all day long and, and you're eating one or two meals a day, that's a bad sign. Yes, sir. No, but that would be great. I'll let you do that study. <laughs> yes, sir. Why don't you, you know, the, those glycemic index cards are at um, uh, uh, habitsofhealth.net. But I can talk to you later afterwards. Just see me and I can give you, you know, direct you to whatever it was that you wanted. I have to be careful about the CME stuff. Well, if that's all, thank you again very much. I just had a hoot and a half talking to you.